this one out. Welcome to Customer Tech Talks. My name's Ben Walters, and this is the place where you'll hear real customer stories from real customers sharing real learnings. We've got two great customers with us today. First up, we have Broadcast Music Incorporated, who've been doing some amazing things with Azure and SQL to help drive their business. But rather than me tell you, let's have a look at the video. Hi, my name is Greg Walrath, Executive Director of Enterprise Architecture at BMI. I've loved music all my life. I'm a big fan of classic rock and roll. And whenever I'm listening to a song on my mobile device, for example, I wanna make sure that those songwriters get paid for that. And that's what BMI does. We collect information throughout the year from various sources, and currently we use a mainframe to process that information to decide what songwriters should get royalty checks. A few years ago, we started the work to modernize and consolidate our technology stack, and we decided that a cloud-based solution made the most sense for us, with platform as a service being our main focus. We chose Azure because we've had a great relationship with Microsoft and worked very closely with their teams for several years. We still have a lot of work ahead of us, but now we're deploying our web apps and processing jobs to app services, and we're using Data Factory and Databricks for ETL with Azure SQL Hyperscale as our database platform. So I'm joined here with the man himself, Greg Walrath. Greg, great to have you with us. Nice to be here. Thank you. So BMI was instrumental, no pun intended, uh, in ensuring that songwriters get paid for their work. In fact, you've been doing this since about 1939, which tells me that this move to Azure probably wasn't as simple as most others, just given the sheer legacy of uh, technology and infrastructure you've been building over the years. Can you tell me about how you started this move? Well, before we could move anything, we had to take inventory of what needed to be moved. Most of our processing is done on a mainframe, and we have a couple hundred or so supporting apps and processing jobs that help. Some of those were written in VB6, some in C-sharp and ASP.NET, Node.js. We have a few ETL platforms and reporting tools and various databases in DB2, Oracle, and SQL Server. Now, I know when we spoke earlier, you mentioned you had over 200 applications, and with that kind of spread of technology, that's just huge to deal with. How did you decide where to start and which application to move first? Well, our distribution processing is broken into two parts, foreign and domestic. At the time we started this move, foreign was consuming about 30% of our mainframe capacity, and it's a self-contained uh, system on its own. And that, you know, putting it in the cloud would free up resources for growth on our mainframe for domestic distribution. So there's kind of a natural division between the two, and that made it easier. Right. And so, as I understand it, once you did that rewrite and you got everything up into Azure and originally Azure SQL, you then moved to SQL Hyperscale. Can you describe why and what drove that decision to make that move? Sure. So most of the SQL uh, platforms in Azure have a four terabyte size limit. Our databases were starting to grow larger than that. And although you can use uh, index and table compression, we would eventually outgrow that four terabyte limit anyway. And then the other reason is the way it separates the, the compute from the storage. You can scale a database up or down very quickly and it doesn't depend on the size of the data. So if we're scaling things up for maintenance, for example, and that maintenance window is shorter, then our systems are available to process more throughout the day. Right. So last question here, as you think back over your move to the cloud over the, the last years and months, can you uh, share any lessons or learnings with others who are looking to take a similar approach or looking to make a similar move? Sure. Uh, the first thing I would say would be keep it simple and do your research up front. We spent about six months or more researching technologies available in Azure before we started the move. And probably the first question you need to answer is are you going to use infrastructure as a service platform as a service or a combination of both, because it makes a big difference in your approach. Uh, the second thing I would say is to take advantage of the DevOps tools that are available. When you're creating resources and managing settings, it's nice to not have to do all of that manually. Uh, keep both of those in mind and your transition will go more smoothly. And then finally, once you're up and running in Azure for a while, you should look at your spending trends and consider buying reserve capacity for the services you're using that offer that discount. That will help you manage costs for the long term. Right. Great input and great points. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ooh. Greg. Next up, we have Kat Weixel from the American Speech, Language and Hearing Association, who has a slightly different story. Let's take a look at the video. Hi, I'm Kat Weixel, the Intranet Manager at the American Speech, Language, Hearing Association in the Washington, D.C. area. 
We serve 211,000 members and affiliates who are speech language pathologists and audiologists making a difference in the lives of their patients and students. We as employees at ASHA need to be productive, engaged, and informed. And we use Microsoft 365 tools to do that. We have SharePoint, Teams, Stream, Yammer, and pretty much the entire product suite we use to keep informed and engaged. Welcome, Kat. Great to have you with us here at Customer Tech Talks. Hi, Ben. I'm really excited to be here. So Asher has been a longtime user of Microsoft products like SharePoint and Office. Uh, however, when you were hit with the pandemic and the shelter in place order, you were faced with less of a technology challenge and more of a social emotional challenge for your employees. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. As soon as the pandemic hit in back in March and we went all remote, one of the things we noticed right away is people just lost that ability to connect naturally within the office environment. We were no longer able to run into each other in the hallways or at the water cooler, and we really started to miss each other. Right. And I know that kind of water cooler conversation is something we kind of take for granted. How did you approach really the stress and even fear of employees who are working remotely? And, and how did you deal with that? Sure. My job um, serving employees is to really look for the low-hanging fruit, what is easy and free to implement. And I had heard actually a story about our customer service department who none of them had ever worked from home before, and they suddenly had to all go all remote overnight. They did an incredible job with that, and I wanted to learn more and share that story out to the rest of staff. So I reached out to the head of that department and did an interview with him and teams. We recorded it and we shared it out for staff to watch. And in that video, he shared not only all the cool, innovative stuff they did pretty much overnight, but also personal fun stuff about him um, and what he was doing after hours. And the reception was just incredible. People really loved watching that. So we kept doing it. It, it, um, I created a channel in stream called Chat with Cat, and that's where I put all the interviews. I uh, interviewed him and other team leaders to learn what they were doing for the employees. I interviewed new hires who were brought on during the pandemic and had never gotten the opportunity to meet anyone in person. And then I did even a special series of team interviews in the month of May. At ASHA, we celebrate Better Hearing and Speech Month, which is always the month of May. And so I did a special series to talk to our speech language pathologists and audiologists on staff to learn what they were doing for our members and also, again, to learn just some fun things about their, their personalities to get to know them better. Sounds like a really great use of you know, Teams and Stream to be able to help drive that connection with people in the organization. And as I understand, it, you've actually given us a, a sample of what some of these interviews look like. Let's take a minute to look at that. Uh, we're expecting a baby girl. But, uh, I do want to be able to, you know, maintain some eye contact and, and just, you know, see expressions. Uh, and I just said I miss their smiling faces, which I do. And I, I've gotten to know everybody's dogs and cats <laughs> and their kids. And they've seen my kids coming through. You know? um, I ended up watching, I think, one of these similar interviews that you did with Gwen. Uh, and I felt like I really got to know Gwen super yeah. well. I have my daughter. She's two years. And watching her growing in front of me, it was a blessing. Really, really. I mean, biggest challenge for me so far. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> Hi, welcome to my work at Hope <laughs> before, before I answer that, I just yeah. wanted to say thank you for this opportunity. I am, I'm really getting to know my colleagues this way. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I've got to tell you, I'm sure we've all had that experience of a child screaming in the background, either in our own house or on a call as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you use the technology to make these kind of interactions happen? Sure. The tech was the easiest part of all of this. We recorded the meetings in Teams. They automatically got uploaded to Stream, where I did some trimming at the front and the back end using those built-in tools for trimming published them out through Stream to all staff, and shared links and embed codes in SharePoint News and in Yammer. The tech was just so easy, anybody could do it. 
Now, I know that the world hasn't stopped, despite the fact that a lot of things have been locked down. And so you've taken on new employees as well. And as we were talking earlier, you mentioned that this has you know, really helped them and they've given you feedback on that as well. Yeah, so it's been well received by all staff, but we've done these new employee interviews. So staff have really enjoyed getting to know the new employees that way. And then I want to share a quote from the guy, Josh, who in the clip was the guy who said, I felt like I really got to know Gwen. He uh, shared later in that same interview this quote, and I just wanted to read it for you because it sums it all up. These interviews help you get to know folks beyond the confines of the daily work activities to get to know a little more about their background and personality helps fe- helps to feel more connected to everyone. So I just thought that really summed it up for me. Really great and awesome validation too that what you're doing is working. Now, I'm sure that there are probably a lot of people watching this right now thinking, wow, I should do the same thing within my own organization and probably facing similar problems. Can you give some pointers or some tips and tricks for people who are looking to maybe embark on a similar way to engage with their employees? Sure. I would say definitely share out your interview questions ahead of time because that really sets people up, puts them at ease, and makes them feel prepared for the interview itself. Um, I would definitely give them tips, if you could, on best lighting and camera placement, uh, internet connection tips, because those are all going to help make that interview go smoothly and make them look good on camera. I didn't do this, but I would recommend maybe if you can set up a schedule so that staff understand when these videos are going to be coming out so they know what to look for and what the themes are going to be. And I also think it's very important to appreciate the fact that a lot of people are working overtime and don't have a lot of free time to watch longer videos. So do some shorter ones or put chapter links in your stream videos so that people can jump to specific points in the interview. Um, And then maybe even do a promo video like what I did and shared just now, 60 seconds of some best of clips to kind of entice new viewers to come and take a look. Ultimately, I think my biggest tip is to say, have fun with this, because that's the most important thing for engagement. Right. Great tips. And I hope others will start to take, you know, take a hint from this as well and build similar things for their own organizations. Thank you so much for joining us, both Kat and Greg. And if you want to find out more information on how to get started with any of the technology we've seen here or discussed here, you can head over to microsoft.com learn or check the links below. Make sure you check out throughout the rest of the event for more customer tech talks.